Hey everybody, Blue Goblin here for the comic book review for the end of July 2015. Yeah, I noticed this too. I'm late on this. Well, you know, life's a busy little bitch sometimes and I apologize for being late with this, but I'm here. I'm here. And, uh... To go ahead and answer everybody's question, I've already been asked this twice. So as I am sitting here filming this right now, no, I have not seen the Deadpool trailer yet. And after I'm done filming this video, I will probably look at that while this video is in the process of uploading. So by the time you are seeing this video, I have probably already viewed it. If not, oh well. <laughs> Um, got some stuff to take care of here. Got, of course, some books from the big two, but I got a lot of indie books here. So we're going to start with DC, go through the indies, and end with Marvel. <coughs> Pardon me. We're going to start with, uh, ooh, chicken and rice. Ooh. Get you right there. We're going to start with DC. We're going to start off with He-Man, The Eternity War, number eight. Dan Abnett, Pop Mahan, I swear, this creative team just needs to stick with He-Man for life. I'm serious. The writing is fantastic. The artwork fits. Now, given what we saw in the last issue concerning Skeletor, I'm thinking, God, they're just trying to go for shocking moment after shocking moment after shocking moment in here. Now... For those of you who are caught up on this series, I don't feel so bad about spoiling things that happened a few issues ago. He-Man broke the sword and reverted permanently back to Prince Adam, or to King Adam, excuse me. And in here, this, this issue begins with a dream Adam has, and it's a pretty intense one. Really intense dream, uh, just all around, just really solid storytelling, Hordak shines true and true as a solid villain for this series. And I'm kind of looking at Skeletor here as a bit of a neutral character. He's damn sure not a hero, but there is some shred of nobility in his actions. A little shred of it, but is Skeletor a hero? Fuck no. But what Skeletor does in here, it makes me, makes me think now more than ever, now he's going to play a huge, pivotal role in this storyline. And there's a certain role that I'm expecting him to play, but I'm not going to spoil what my thoughts are. You know, it's going to, when, it comes time, when it comes time to reveal what Skeletor's true role in this, in this storyline is, then I'll say whether or not I was right on my you know, secret prediction. Uh, stuff is really good in here. Adam is actually battling a cold in here. Since he's not He-Man anymore, he is now frail, he can get sick, you know, blah, 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 blah. But all around, solid issue with a what the fuck kind of ending. Really solid stuff. I really enjoyed this. This easily gets a 4 out of 5 for me. Alright. Moving on to Justice League Gods and Monsters Superman one-shot. Oh, my God. Dematis, great rock, but Bruce Tim. Oh, my God. This was amazing. Was this as good as the Batman one shot last week? No. No, I don't think it was. But it was still an outstanding read. I'm one of those comic book nerds that I, I'm going to tell you the truth. There are times I don't give a fuck about Superman. But when they... But Superman is one of those characters. I don't really hardly follow him at all. I gave him a chance. I gave him another chance when the New 52 started, but I'd easily just drop right out of it. Superman Unchained was actually really good. Superman is one of those characters where I'll give him a try if the story's good enough. If the story doesn't captivate me, I'm not interested. It's one, He's one of those kinds of characters. You know, I respect the character, but I'm not a really huge fan of him. You know what I'm saying? But in this, I'm wondering, 
is this Kal-El? Because it damn sure ain't Clark Kent. He's from Mexico, I believe. I can't even remember what they call him in here. But the way he ends up becoming Superman is just really good. Now, as good as this book is, I can't help but notice the biggest flaw in this particular issue. And that is just a personal opinion. I'm not saying this is a fact. But how I feel, how I felt when I read this book, I felt like I read something from Marvel. Let me explain this. Superman in here is kind of treated like one of the X-Men. He's kind of treated like a mutant. He's shunned by humanity, spit on, you know, rid ridiculed, all kinds of stuff. The people treat him in this book like pe like humans treat mutants in Marvel. It just came off that way. It really did. And to, you know, see the struggles that he goes through on how he should use his powers and everything is just really good. But this right here is a Superman that don't fuck around. He really doesn't. And I thought it was handled really well. It's not really anything original. I've seen storytelling like this done before, but this still was a good book. I did enjoy it. It was really good. Despite all those flaws, I'm still going to give it a four. I really was captivated that much by this issue. All right, we're ending DC with Sensation Comics number 12. This series has really stepped it up. Pro Early on in this series, this series focused on the multiple stories done in one book stuff where some of the stories were cute, funny, witty, or flat out silly. Now we're starting to get more serious stuff and we get to see different tales told for Wonder Woman from like different time periods, alternate time periods, past or what may be and stuff like that. And I really dig that. I really thought this was good. And in this book, she's dealing... She's teaming up with Poison Ivy to take on Typhon, the father of all monsters. You know, I whoa. And the sea Typhon, he looks badass. Just looks really badass. Uh, to see Ivy, you know, working alongside Diana because Ivy is communicating with with the with the uh, with the grounds, with the dirt, with the earth, or whatever, you know, on Diana's on Diana's island, and it kind of, it came to the conclusion that Typhon was returning, and it was sending the other Amazons into a panic. Now the second story was good, but I mean the stuff with Ivy was really solid. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a good book. Uh, give it a three point five. All right. Moving on to Chapter House Comics, we're going to Captain Canuck number three. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I am not even going to try to pronounce the name of the fucking writer. I will butcher it for sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this was interesting. It's basically like a backstory telling of... <laughs> Jackass. <laughs> this is basically a backstory telling of, you know, Captain Canuck, how he, you know, discovered his brother after his brother went missing and everything like that. Not really much happens in here to really truly captivate me. This was well above average, but it, this particular issue didn't exactly feel memorable. You know what I'm saying? I thought it was nice for what it was. I like the electrically charged billy club. I thought that was a pretty nice touch. You know, he can use weapons and everything, but he just, I guess he just rarely ever uses guns in here. Thought it was nice for what it was. A decent issue. But then again, like I said, not really going to be memorable down the road. I'd give it a 3.5, though. I'll be nice. Ugh, pardon me. Going on to uh, IDW with Jim and the Holograms, number five. Uh, hmm. This this issue was was fun. It was cute. It, it felt like a Saturday morning cartoon. It had that kind of feel to it. You know, and I just... <laughs> I'm such a dude. I looked at this cover, and I see Kimber the open lesbian of the of the uh, of the series I just can't help but notice she's holding a pie 
Yeah, I think that, that I think that shit was done on purpose. Um. Yeah, this the, the, all this was was basically the bands bickering at each other over you know speculations and accusations while you know trying to maintain a social life and all that stuff. This was this was cute for what it was. It was a fun read. It wasn't bad. Um. Then again, I just don't think this is one of those comic book series that's meant to be taken seriously. I feel like this is one of those series where just read it and enjoy it and have fun with it. There you go. Uh, a 3.5, though. I thought it was still pretty good. Let's see. Going to Dynamite with Red Sonja, number 17. Gail Simone and Walter Giovanni. There's something about Gail Simone's writing that really really works for me and Walter Giovanni's artwork is really well detailed, really well put together and helps sell the story, how the way it's written, the way the plot goes, the way the the pacing goes for the storytelling. It's really, really good. And I just I love how Gail just loves to write Red Sonya as a complete fucking drunk. And <laughs> what this basically was was, you know, Red Sonya having a party night to herself after she, you know, basically defeated death herself, just beat death in a sword fight, and so she's going to celebrate, yet these these maidens are going to recruit her to preserve a library, and it's in here that I'm reminded, I've, I've seen this before, where she's not really good at reading, so, you know, at first she kind of laughs it off, like, who wants to protect a bunch of paper with writing on it, you know, and then she's like, okay, what what the hell, let me give it a go. But the way Simone writes it, it's just really, it's just really fluid, it flows very well, Walter Giovanni's artwork helps sell it, just all around good stuff, I love it, I give it a four. <sighs> Sticking with Dynamite, we're going to Red Sonja, Vulture Circle, number five. Collins and Lieberman, uh, okay, I read this book seeing how Red Sonja is depicted in this book, I just couldn't help but notice it, it felt like I was looking at the Phoenix from Marvel, it just kind of had a Jean Grey-ish kind of feeling to it, and I was like, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, but I thought the story wrapped up very nicely. You know, you have a, a person who's literally possessed by a god taking on somebody who thinks they're a god when you know that this character's full of shit. And I loved the way Sonya dealt with this asshole. I thought it was very, very well executed. Um, I'm not going to ruin the ending, though. I'm not going to ruin the ending... I'm not going to ruin the way the, the the book ends. Thought it was nice. Nicely done. Kind of opens it up for more... It, it, it kind of left it open for more storytelling for this kind of time period for Sonya. And I thought it wrapped up very well. It took like 40 forevers for this damn storyline to finish. But I think it'd be worth your time to go ahead and get in on trade when it comes out. Uh, a solid read. Really good. Kind of, kind of lacking in the originality area, but I thought it was good. 3.5. Okay, we're going to IDW. Going back to IDW, excuse me. We're going to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 48. Donatello's body lays comatose on the table, yet he finds his mind and trapped in a machine. I love that classic horror stories cover here. It's a nice homage to covers of the past. Just really good. In here, you got the you got the turtles dealing with Stockman's fly Mauser bots. I don't even know what the fuck they're called. Um, you know, Shredder and his his clan are like they're questioning him. Is like, why are you working with Baxter Stockman? He's an outsider. He wasn't raised to be a part of this clan. He wasn't trained to be a part of this clan. And he's like, you know, I'm not using him. And he's like, I'm not using him to benefit the clan. I'm using him to benefit me. And, you know, they're saying, you know, what about your granddaughter, Karai? He's like, what about her? I mean, he's such a dick. It's just, but he, it, it, it helps add, it, it's a plus for character development. Very nicely done. And the artwork in here is good. Uh, it kind of, the artwork, I done forgot who does it, but it's not Santiago, but I kind of help 
can't help but notice it, the, the artwork's trying to feel like his, and still trying to keep the turtles with their own unique looks. You know, you know, it's, you look past the colored headbands, and you still give them each their own very unique look, the way they're drawn and everything, and I think that helps also with the uh, story development as the plot paces along. You know, and it's like, you know, the turtles are have got their their backs against the wall. You know, when it comes to the fighting and everything, you know, tough decisions are made in here, and it really benefits who they are as as heroes and everything. Just really nicely done. You know, Stockman's got a priority, but the turtles are kind of questioning whether they should, you know, protect protect one certain character or another certain character because at this point in time they really can't afford to be separated. It's one of those kinds of stories, and I thought it was handled very well. Eastman and Waltz did a very fantastic job with this, and I'm rambling too fucking much about this issue. Uh, really solid read. Loved it. Bitch and cliffhanger. Give it a four. All right, moving on to Marvel. We'll start Marvel off with my pick of the week. Yeah, Daredevil, number 17. As if you had to fucking guess. You knew this was going to end up being my pick of the week. This was outstanding. Mark Wade working that goddamn magic like he knows how to. I swear, I don't think anybody else could write this series as solid as he can. But when the time comes for Mark Wade to step down, you know, people, you know, I've even gotten this question on Tumblr. You know, it's like, who do you think should write Daredevil once Mark Wade decides to step down? And I can only think of one name right off the top of my head, and that would be Ed Brubaker guy who had it before him because Ed Brubaker did a good job he did a lot more darker and grittier stories and he always was teamed up with dark artists kind of made it look a little Batman-ish but it was still really good and in here damn Kingpin shines as a villain very very well done you know Matt thinks he's got him Matt thinks he's got him to where he can you know bargain with him and you know you know, get what he wants, but Matt quickly realizes, and us readers see the way the story is told, that Matt's fucked. And there's no other way to put it. He's fucked. And when this issue ends, oh, God, is he fucked. Kingpin is not one to screw around, and he doesn't bluff, so I'm wondering, what the hell is going to happen in the next issue? This was so gripping. Uh, really emotional, really high on the drama, good action, solid storytelling. This was fantastic. An easy 4.5. It wasn't perfect, but damn it, it was close. Nicely done. Nicely done. We're ending this review with Star Wars number 7, Jason Aaron and uh, Simone Bianchi. Wow. You don't, get to see, you don't get to see this artist very much. When you do, it's a treat. It's one of those very rare occasions you can see Simone Bianchi's art. Um, but Jason Aaron is still hitting it out of the park with this. Uh, this is basically a backstory telling, you know, this is like what happened between episodes three and four. You know, Obi-Wan, he's basically the last surviving Jedi, the way this issue is told. And it shows just what he was doing while he was watching Luke as a, as a young boy. You know, and he's like struggling with his decisions, you know, should he still work as a Jedi or should he work more as a hermit? You know, you really see the struggles and he's even trying to communicate with his old master, Qui-Gon Jinn. And he's really struggling and it's just really nicely done. You get to see him use some of his Jedi, use the Force in some ways without fully, you know, pulling out the lightsaber and just killing a bunch of bastards. But, you know... It's just really good. I guess you can say this is how Obi-Wan became Ben Kenobi. I guess you could say this is the origin of Ben Kenobi. You could go there. You really could. But it was a nice one and done issue. Really good. Really good for what it was. I, I'm digging the Star Wars books from Marvel. I think they're doing a really good job. I know some, there are some diehard Star Wars nerds out there who probably hate this shit because it's not happening in the fucking movies. It doesn't count. I think it does count. I think, you know, it adds to it. You know, it adds to it because you, you never really knew what happened in between the movies. And this is a solid 
way to basically tell it and I think they're doing a good job for what they're for what it's worth uh, this was a solid read. I really liked it. I think you would too. Give the Star Wars series a chance. It's not too late. You can get on board with this. Uh, I'd give this issue a four. I thought it was good. Well, that's all I got for this uh, review, everybody. Uh, I also want to say to uh, my old buddy, uh, Brandon Hex, I'm sorry for what YouTube did to you. I'm sorry for what Marvel did to you. Uh, if you want to quit doing videos on YouTube, hey, I completely understand and I respect that. But if you are planning on coming back, I hope you come back with a bang, man, and uh, sorry for what Marvel did to you, man. I really am. Uh, Shout-outs also to my bro, the Mount Verdon kid. He's getting ready for a comeback, I hope. You know, I spoke to him the other day, and I, I'm i ready to see what he's got in store for us when he gets back into the reviewing, re the reviewing shtick. And, of course, my old buddy Deadpoolzilla, still killing it there. Um... Please subscribe to this channel, Blue Goblin Zero One. Don't forget my Blue Goblin X channel. Uh, we we got a video done for Arkham Asylum Studio, but we have yet I have yet to upload it. I've been that lack I've been that slacking here, and we got another one coming up on the way. And uh, I'll give you a clue about what the not what the very next video is going to be, but what an, uh, a future video for Arkham Asylum Studio is going to be. It's going to be about my girlfriend's favorite character. I think I think that should give you a big enough clue there. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at BlueGoblin01. You can follow me on Tumblr, Pinterest, Facebook, or stick here on YouTube. But it doesn't matter to me as long as you enjoy what you're seeing here. Thanks again for watching, everybody. Y'all have y'all y'all just keep being you. Have a good time. I am Groot. I'll see y'all later.